Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Aron. I'm a museum educator. Thank you for coming on the Art Stop, our short 15-minute spiel about a work of art. And today I'm going to be talking about this work right here. This is Peter Hurd, and it's called The Eve of St. John from 1960. This is one of those works that's in our collection. It's been around for a while. I see it all the time, and I've always kind of taken it for granted. Um, it's a lovely work of art. Felt like I kind of knew everything there was to know about it, ignorantly. And then I decided that it might make an interesting work for an art stop, um, mainly because of the subject and also the person in the painting. And I thought there could be something to be learned about this young lady and this scene. I knew Peter Hurd was an artist, American artist, um, that he lived in New Mexico on a ranch, and that many of his works uh, reflect the landscape of New Mexico and of the West. He himself was actually a cowboy, which is something I did not know. Um, he was quite adept at everything from rodeo to fixing fences and everything a ranch hand would do in New Mexico, in addition to being a really uh, talented painter and artist. And I have a, a photo of him here. There he is. He wore his Stetson and his boots, and um, he was just really a, a rancher when it, when it came down to it. So I, I, I admire that about him. I think he was a really multi-talented personality. And if you'd like, you could pass that around so you can get a closer look. So he painted people that you would find on his ranch in New Mexico. And this is uh, one of the people you would find on his ranch. Her name was Dorotea Herrera, and she was the daughter of his ranch hand, Jose Herrera. So he would paint a lot of cowboys, ranch hands. Um, he painted his, um, his daughter. He painted a lot of people that you would find in these surrounding areas. But he was especially fond of his ranch hand, who is his friend for many, many years, Jose, and his daughter, who was about 10 years old, at the time, and in fact, he painted Jose, and here's another image for you right off the bat, of Jose Herrera, also on Herd's Ranch in New Mexico. So we can pass that around as well. But you see some similarities between that portrait, of which many of his portraits were um, of a figure that were standing against a landscape. So very similar to this one. And he said he really liked to paint Jose in particular, which is that image we're passing around. He said he was very paintogenic. So he said he really <laughs> liked the way he turned out in his paintings. In fact, he would, uh, Heard would often ignore whatever fence had to be fixed or whatever duties he had so that he could paint Jose in particular. So I thought that was rather interesting. Then he turns to Jose's daughter, Dorotea, and this is, um, She's holding a candle. It's called the Eve of St. John. So we know it's the celebration of the Eve of St. John, which is St. John the Baptist. So the Eve of St. John's um, birth. St. John, of course, the uh, cousin of Jesus. And it's, it's a, a holiday that's actually commemorated by light, by candles and by fire. And the equivalent, the pagan equivalent, is midsummers or the summer solstice and so often celebrated in the West. And in Ireland, I believe it's a huge ordeal. You have a bonfire, and people jump through the bonfire to celebrate it. But here she is with the candle. So she's, it's like a procession. So maybe going to Mass, but commemorating that holiday. And Heard really was, he was a little bit religious himself, um, but he was very sensitive to uh, the, the beliefs of those who surrounded him. And in New Mexico, a lot of immigrants and uh, migrant workers on his ranch celebrated this holiday. So he paints this, this custom. And, and he had Dorotea here pose with the candle to celebrate this at dusk in his ranch. And uh, at this point, I'll say I, I tried my best to contact Dorotea, who is still alive, and I searched for all of the Doroteas Herreras I could find in New Mexico, and I sent out about 30 letters just saying, you know, I think this may be the, the Dorotea Herrera 
that is the subject of this painting. And if it is, would you mind speaking with us? Because we'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience in posing for this painting. Well, I never heard anything back. So um, either I didn't get the right Dorotea or she just was not interested in speaking with us at this time. Um, but later I found out through some more research that she, she actually goes by Dorothy Herrera, which is a common thing that women would you know, change their name to the different pronunciation. But she um, still was not interested in, or I didn't get the right Dorothy Herrera either. But uh, I did find out that I wasn't sure whether she had any special significance for the artist or whether she was just a convenient um, person who he could use as a model at this time. But I did find out through one source that she had no idea what this painting was about when she posed for it. All she knew was that her older brothers told her that she would have to hold <coughs> still for a really long time and it would be really difficult. And she had to hold this candle, and I think it, she said it took something like three weeks for him to, um, to work from her posing with a candle. And then in those three weeks, they went through numerous, numerous candles burning down over time. So she was a very patient young lady to pose for this artist. So he takes a really straightforward approach, and I think he really does a, a nice job of capturing the light, both from the candle the way that it shows through her hands there against her face, and then the light, of course, from the sky, and then the light in this house in the background as well. And one way that he was able to do such a, a nice job of capturing this is through his technique, which is actually not you would, what you would think it is. It's not an oil painting. It's not an acrylic painting. It's a tempera painting. Not just tempera, but it's an egg tempera painting. So he actually worked in egg tempera, which was a technique, of course, developed in the Renaissance, where you actually use an egg yolk, and you mix the egg yolk as the binder with pigments. And it creates a really fresh, really um, unique medium, of course, used in frescoes in the Renaissance. And he uses this egg tempera, which creates a more of a dull, sort of matte finish to the painting, rather than that vibrant, shiny, rich oil paint, but it creates a really subtle, beautiful effect with the colors, as you can see here. And that technique actually influenced some other artists, which he developed at the time. And um, I'd like to read you a quote of his, because I, I think I like, I like to really capture what the artist said. Um, I think that is one of the best ways for us to experience the work. And in fact, when I was in this gallery the other day, I overheard a visitor say, wow, this really takes me there. I just feel like I'm in New Mexico in the dust. And I really like that. So what Hurd said about his use of light, he said, any time in any place can exhibit this transience of color and light. Perhaps the most dramatic is here in San Patricio itself, where light effects at dusk have so often caused an exciting race with time. The figures of my neighbors involved in a lost and found pattern created by the dust haze of the evening. The orange ochre light from a window in a house. Instantly invoking for the beholder the warm security that dwells within earthen walls. And I yearn for some magical pigment that could suggest the diamond splendor of Venus when in her role as an evening star. I have also wished in vain for some way in which to suggest the lowing of cattle or the tinkle of goat bells as the goat herds bring in their flocks at dusk, for some way in which to capture my reverie and sometimes tears for the changing earth. So we really do feel as if you know, we're there in, in the evening, and I think he, his words explain it best. You know, the light on in the house and this moment um, when the light was just perfect. Um, if this reminds you of another American landscape from about the same time, a little earlier, actually, in which there is a female figure um, against the landscape. Anybody want to venture a guess? Christine's world. Yes, Christina's world. I saw a couple other hands up. That's right. You would be correct. Um, Andrew Wyeth, Christina's World, which I have an image of right here if you're not familiar with it. 
Um, and I'm not just showing you that for no good reason, but actually he was very closely connected to the Wyeths, if, in case you did not know. He um, moved from New Mexico to Pennsylvania. Well, first he um, joined the army uh, at West Point, and then he ended up in Pennsylvania, where he met and studied under the artist N.C. Wyeth, who is a commercial illustrator, um, very successful illustrator, and actually he learned a lot of illustration techniques at that point. And that is how he met Andrew Wyeth, who was N.C. Wyeth's youngest son. So the two of them worked closely together, and that egg tempera technique was actually something that Wyeth um, supposedly learned from Heard. So they worked together. And um, not only did he meet the Wyeths, Andrew and NC, but NC's daughter, um, Henrietta, I believe was her name, Henrietta. Um, well, he married Henrietta and brought her back to New Mexico with him. So the Herds and the Wyeths are really closely connected in that way. And so he moved back to New Mexico and, um, and brought Henrietta with, with him. And they expanded, they bought the ranch and slowly over time bought some more land to go with the ranch. And they named the ranch Sentinel Ranch. That was called Sentinel Ranch, which was named for uh, one of these mountains, which are probably one of these two pictured right there. And you can actually visit Sentinel Ranch today and not only can you visit Sentinel Ranch but you can stay there as a guest and you can rent one of the numerous houses or cottages if you so desire to experience this lovely landscape. You can also get married at Sentinel Ranch it turns out. It's also a wedding venue um, and it looks quite lovely actually. I went to their website and um, you know very similar to what we see painted here. This is a current image of Sentinel Ranch and it is still owned and operated by um, the Hurd family. So Michael Hurd was a uh, son of Peter and Henrietta's and he was also an artist um, and there are some other um, people involved that run the ranch. So if you're ever in New Mexico you may want to stop by and say hello. Um, they also knew, the Hurds and the Wyeths also knew if you can think of any other artist who may have lived and worked in New Mexico and painted the landscape in New Mexico. Anyone? Georgia O'Keeffe, that's right. So Georgia O'Keeffe actually you know, lived and worked in New Mexico as well at about the same time. So the uh, herds were a little bit younger. But they supposedly knew um, the O'Keeffe's, knew Georgia, and they would go to her ranch as well for parties. And um, supposedly, and this was a story that Peter Heard had relayed to Michael, um, and that's why I read this, they went to, uh, to Georgia's ranch and they were invited for a party. And they were very friendly with her, um, but Michael at the time was very young, and um, apparently he was quite a hellion and he caused a lot of trouble and um, almost wrecked this nice relationship the Herds had with, the, with Georgia. And that was when he said something like, this party is boring and I don't like any of this art. And she was not very happy about that, but, you know, of course, he was a young kid, so I think they let it go as water under the bridge. Um, so I just thought that was a neat little anecdote as well. So he had his pretty successful career um, as an artist, as an illustrator, um, but yeah, he had to supplement his income a little bit because as a painter you have to have a little bit of a business entrepreneurial sense in order to make ends meet. So he did a couple commissions, one of which was the president, Lyndon B. Johnson, and unfortunately uh, did not go over so well with President Johnson. Um, what happened was uh, he posed for Heard, but supposedly only once, and fell asleep during his sitting. And Heard had to complete the portrait without uh, actually seeing him, so he did so from a photograph. And he completed the portrait, which I have right here, which I'll show you in a second. 
and showed it to President Johnson and he said it was the ugliest thing he ever saw. So unfortunately, it did not end up in um, the White House. It is now in the Smithsonian's the National Portrait Gallery. Okay, so there it is right there. And I will pass that around and you can judge for yourself whether you think it is in fact the ugliest thing you have ever seen. <laughs> but despite that, that little um, bump in the road, um, Heard was able to make a pretty good living and he also supplemented his income as actually was quite common at the time um, through advertising. So he created a couple paintings <coughs> specifically for advertisements. And there's a couple great images here. Here's one he made for Lucky Strike tobacco. And it says Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Grading leaf, painted from life on a Carolina farm by Peter Hurd. There is your quintessential American tobacco farming family sitting there working on their tobacco. Um, so he, he kind of sold out. <laughs> um, but, you know, artists had to, to make ends meet. Right? So it kind of reminds me of um, some of the other American artists who would create works of art commissioned by the railroad. So a while back I gave an art stop on Thomas Moran, another artist who actually created works of art for the railroad, which was a little bit controversial, a little bit hypocritical in some ways, but I wouldn't say that about him. Um, so that's a whole other art stop we won't get into. He also created another ad, which I just love this one, for Dotson. And here is a Peter Hurd original um, featuring a brand new shiny Dotson 610 hardtop. So he's got the Dotson in there in his iconic American landscape, and there's a cowboy there giving the, the Dotson driver some directions, and it says, there is the right road. Okay, so you can take a look at that. But, you know, again, he had to supplement his income. Um, so he's doing so through advertisements. That landscape there as well is one I've seen in a couple of his works, very, very similar um, with the, you know, the windmill and the water hole. So um, he never quite made it into the upper echelon of this very important American artist once the abstract expressionists and abstraction sort of T took over the art scene starting in the 1950s. But I think it's significant that he stayed true to what he knew and to what he loved, which was the American landscape, of course, and the ranch, which is where his heart really was, um, much like O'Keeffe as well, sticking true to what you love. And for, for Heard, he said art was really a record um, of his emotional response to existence. And I'll I'll leave you with um, one other quote here, which I think also sums up that desire to express what one truly loves through art. And he said, what is it that motivates me in the first place and brings on these frenzied races against time and light? If the effort is destined to have any success, it must be triggered by an inner elation, an excited reaction to some color or light effect, which by its inevitable evanescence, is always productive of delight and despair. Despair that is so quickly changing and so difficult to record. So he, st he really stayed true to what he enjoyed and I think we see that reflected in his work. So I think that about concludes our art stop. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.